It's a high tech conversation. On the low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. Um, good to see everybody's faces back to, back on here. Um, I, I'm absolutely shattered. We've, we've had a very long week. Um, we've had uh, Ofsted in to inspect us. Um, clearly, I can't tell you what happened, um, but uh, maybe that says a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's been, it's been quite difficult. We, the cases, COVID cases, we're hearing up to 18,000 now a day, and the hospital cases are rising as well. So um, it really is uh, going back to where we were back in, back in March. So please, please keep safe, everybody. So what's really good about tonight is that we're going to have uh, one of our regulars um, that we, we bullied um, on a couple of sessions ago to, to be able to speak tonight. Um, and so Andy's going to talk to, to us about his uh, plane collection. Um, he's got such a vast collection that I think he's only going to focus on one particular area um, of, of rebate planes. So I'm uh, really looking forward to it. So I suggest that everybody, what you do is you um, do the same stuff, put it on to speak of you, um, keep yourselves muted. Um, and enjoy the talk and uh, we can ask the questions afterwards. So um, Andy, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, evening all. A um, few words of introduction about me because may a lot of you don't know me. Um, I'm in the happy position that although I started doing woodwork as many householders probably do um, because they were hard up and needed some furniture, um, in the last 10, 15 years, I've been able to do it much more as a hobby. And several things came together to steer me down the path of putting my electric router away in a box, using my table saw as a table, and exploring these funny old wooden brown funny tools that uh, you know, didn't plug in. Um, didn't necessarily make sense at first glance. Um, one of the things that uh, kicked off buying tools at all was that I, I bought a, a vice on eBay, um, which came with a box of tools as well, so I had to have them. Um, inevitably, that means more tools arrive. They're easy to find, they're cheap to buy, and they're useful and they spread and they accumulate and here in my little basement workshop they've gradually filled up the available shelf space they've overflowed a bit into drawers and cupboards and boxes um but i've i've pulled a few out this evening uh ready to show you and talk about and i want to try and get over a bit of why i think they're interesting and useful and the whole subject veers off in so many directions at once now, I'm very well aware that to some of you, you know, you, you've been doing this donkey's years, you'll know far more about it than I do, um, and it'll be very familiar. I hope I'll find a few things that won't be familiar, um, but we're not all in that category, and there may be some things that are um, new and surprising. What I'll do, rather than show you my face, um, most of the time I'll home in on the bench and that's the that's the first one i want to talk about it's a perfectly ordinary plain wooden rebate plane um it's actually about 200 years old but you can only know that by looking at the maker's name on the toe and looking it up because they stayed looking very much the same uh, for several centuries it's a lovely user it's a simple tool, but there's some subtleties to it because the, the left-hand side of this escapement hole is larger than the right. So as the shavings come up, they hit the wedge on the end, they slope on the end of the wedge and they curl out the side. Fine, that's a rebate plane. Um, I will Put this one in the in the mix as well, because that is actually the first old tool I ever bought, and I bought that before all the others, when I just needed to make a rebate, and for sentimental value, it's an ordinary tool, it's no maker's name, but 
whoever had it thought it was worth putting a bit of boxwood on the sole, giving it another lease of life, and it's carried on for a few hundred years yet. If you're coming at this for the first time, that's probably more the sort of thing you'll find, about an inch wide, um, still with a, a skewed iron. Um, skewed irons are actually easier to find than square across the body, I think. Um, some old catalogues you see skewed cost thrums or sixpence more. Later on, there seemed to be no difference in the price. It was just, just as easy to make a skewed iron as to make a straight one. Um, they vary, of course. Um, one, one obvious way of varying is to make them much bigger. That's a green slave made in Bristol, two inches wide, and that's about as wide as they used to go. And frankly, that's quite a lot of wood to be pushing your way through. Bearing in mind that most of the time these weren't taking off wispy little shavings. These were for making um, a structural element. So you want them as thick as you could push. So that's what, you know, so far so good. Um, and as I say, range of sizes. Half inch was the commonest size in many catalogues. And you see how you, know, you need to have a few because you might be doing something big and chunky. You might not want to balance a very wide plane on the edge of a piece of wood. There might even be something else in the way, especially if you were making a big molding, you were making some rebates on which to run hollows and rounds to make shapes. Could there only be room for a little of The smallest one I've got so far is a quarter of an inch. And you can see that's actually a bit of an oddity that it's, it's got to be rebated on the body itself so that there's enough wood for the mortise where the wedge and the iron go and slim at the bottom. But then it's also got this concave molding along the top, along the, the middle and a much different wedge. And actually, I'm pretty sure this plane is French. Very similar apart from a distinctively French wedge and some very French looking lettering on the end, which probably won't show up, but actually says, quarter of an inch. And the main reason I know it's French is that I bought it in a batch of tools um, along with this and another half dozen French molding planes. And that's marked with a French maker or forged a Vulcan in Paris. Um, there's a subtle difference as well along the tops that European planes generally have a sort of quarter round molding shape all the way along, um, sometimes halfway down, sometimes all the way down. It's a tiny thing, but the tiny things make the difference between one country and another. And you know, variations on a theme. There's, there's another French rebate plane, same sort of quarter round rebates at the top same square curvy wedge um but this one's been compassed it's been curved along the sole so that it can make either a deep rebate with a a flat bottom which is curved or it can be used on its side to clear out something that is curved on plan and that might be in architectural joinery it might be in making a revolving door, um, a fancy counter for a bar or an arched window, all sorts of things. Clearly, different pieces of that sort of work um, would need different curves and different sizes. There's a much smaller one. Um, I was trying to find out who made this tonight. Um, 
there's no no maker's name on it there's an owner's name which says h vardo vardo i now know didn't know this an hour ago um is a very unusual name almost all the vardos come from one area of cornwall and they worked as um china clay diggers apart from one or two that escaped including henry vardo who went to live in hanwell in middlesex where he worked as a, a cabinet maker now it may not be him but it's probably him the dates are about right he was 1860 uh, 62 years old in 1899 so it's a mid 19th century user made rebate plane very competently done and i'm sure it was exactly useful for what henry was doing at the time curves you've got to plane those curves there's no other way you haven't got a, an electric router to do them the other way you could have a curve is sideways on sorry i got my hands in the way that's curved that way so imagine this cutting down into an arched rebate of some sort um clearly you'd need different sizes different tightnesses of curvature um that's working both ways in one plane and it's got most of the body cut away via handle and most people most catalogues um would refer to these as coachmakers planes and it bothers me a bit that I know nothing about how wooden coaches were made. There must be good reasons why these particular planes were needed. And I can see that the whole thing is full of curves rather than straight lines. And there would be you know, a rebate into which the curved door shut. But why did coachmakers need a different sort of rebate plane? which is like this, um, where the body has been cut away and the wide part of the blade is just a tiny bit down at the base. One book I read said it's because a lot of the work is in tight corners. It means you can grip the thing without your fingers getting in the way. You can get right down into the, the edges of the um, the coach work that you're doing. This one, by the way, could be anywhere between 1880 and 1930 from the maker's name. It's from Buck of London and from the address they were at, that gives the dates. And that's one of the big, complicated family dynasties of tool dealers. Buck, um, as related to Buck and Ryan, that some people remember in London and Buck and Hickman, who are still in business as um, wholesale suppliers of planes. Another thing that people say is that actually this does this job of two planes because you can lay it on its side and you can use it to widen a groove into which the edge of the plane will fit. It would. I mean, maybe that's true. And I think there's a theme with old tools that behind every variation there's an ingenious workman it's a craftsman that's been standing at the bench talking about uh, thinking about the job that he's doing and has thought there's an easier way i could just make a plane that was a little bit different i could add a fence i could add a stop i could change the uh, slope of the blade and when you're using hand tools all day long those extra little efficiency gains must have really mattered. I think it's it's a bit like the the sort of intellectual effort that today goes into software, into apps. Each of these planes is a an app for a particular task. Um, they may not have all been the world's best, and we'll come to some that are probably duds indeed. There's another. Another little coachmaker's tea rebate, definitely made by the user. And 
got a very odd shaped wedge because he must have realized that he'd made the wedge so long that he wasn't going to be able to adjust the iron by tapping it with a hammer unless he cut away a bit of the wedge. So why not? You're a craftsman, you're at your bench, you can do these things. You don't necessarily have to go down to the tool shop and accept what they've got. Making and modifying tools is something that craftsmen have always done. And once you start acquiring quite a number of similar tools, you'll find places where it has been done. This, this plane, you'll probably notice if I compare it to an ordinary one, it's a bit longer. And many of you will know the reason that it's probably an 18th century plane and the wedge profile is distinctively different. So I think what's happened here is that somebody was looking around the workshop for a plane that they wanted to modify and they picked on the one that was already 100 years old. And the modification has just been to uh, put that around so you can see it, plane the bottom at an angle. So it could be used for things like sliding dovetails, um, which I've used it for, um, where you can then hold the plane vertical and get your angle cut nice and simply. Good simple modification. These planes are cheap, they're plentiful. It's a bit of half done work that you can finish off in your own way. Another really common sort of modification that you'll find is nailing or screwing on a fence. And here we've got a little rather battered old rebate plane where somebody's gone to the scrap box, they've made uh, a fence to go across half the width. They must have had some repetitive job where they definitely needed a rebate of, what is it, about 3 sixteenths. They didn't want to bother measuring it, mark it every time, putting a fence on the tool, uh, fixed on with two mismatched screws that were just a little bit too long and sort of come through in spots on the other side, it meant that the job could be done quickly, easily, economically. If you, haven't, if you hadn't got a suitable plane to do that with, you could make your own. You can see this one's got screw holes where it's had a fence on, but there's no escapement hole. This, although it's a rebate plane now, it started out, started out as something else. It was probably a hollow all round. If I put that side by side with the same size plane, you can see that what the craftsman's done is just to take the iron out, plane the bottom of the plane off square, grind the iron square, and put it back together. So it's a a side escapement plane, like a hollow all round, doesn't have the hole in. But it's, a, it's then become an available plane to use for that special job set aside for it. Cheap and easy and available. So we can see that sometimes there must have been jobs where the the requirement for the size of the rebate you are making stayed the same. And if you build in a depth stop and a fence, you get what's called a standing philister. And that will make a rebate that's that wide, that's seven eighths of an inch, and that deep, which is three sixteenths. And if you want to make a rebate three sixteenths deep and seven eighths wide, that's the very easiest thing to do. All you've got to do is put it on the side of the wooden push. Why would you want to do that? The probable answer, according to books and articles that I've read, is that this was a solution that came about early on 
in the history of uh, sash window making, where the the better method that survived hadn't yet been worked out, and making the rebates for the glass was done with a rebate plane, such as people were used to, and you would cut down one side of the wood and cut down the other. And by having a fixed plane like this, you could hand the job to an apprentice or somebody junior and just have them produce the required uh, sections all day long. And although these hardly appear in catalogues, there's a, a slightly more frequently listed plane called a, a greenhouse rabbit plane. And if you imagine making a wooden greenhouse and planing all those sections by hand, you'd want a plane that uh, did the marking out for you. And that's what they were in a slightly smaller size. That's not the only job where um, a particular size rebate was called for. And there's another, um, another example, which I think is even more unusual. Um, I can't say for absolutely certain because it doesn't come labeled, but I think this plane here is an example of what's called a cockbead philister. Um, they're known about because there were two of them in the seat and chest, um, and they were itemized in the, the list of tools that uh, Gabriel had provided. I'm, I assume everyone knows, but just in case, the seat and chest is a, a wonderful survivor from the 18th century of um, a complete chest of tools made for a young man going into the trade that somehow became separated from being used and it's been preserved and it's like a time capsule into what the, the well set up um, joiner and cabinet maker would have had in the 18th century. Much admired, much studied. Um, the, the idea of a, a cockbead philister, um, if you imagine a drawer um, and you want to put a decorative strip around the fronts of the drawer, uh, to frame it. You first fit the drawer, you then need to remove a little bit of wood all the way around to put this decorative uh, moulding into. And the idea of this was that you could cut a fairly deep rebate going down onto the edge of the drawer, um, same size all round. It's got a, a nicker here to um, sever the fibres when you're working across the grain. That's the, the sort of story, but there's a school of thought, an uh, interesting article by somebody a few years ago saying they reckon it was actually an 18th century toolmaker's ploy. It's a really impractical tool. Um, you don't need a long plane. It's quicker to saw the rebates on the ends use an ordinary rebate plane on the sides. And that sort of accounts for why they're rare and the examples that come to light don't show much use. So just as not all phone apps are brilliant and don't all get a million downloads, sometimes there's an idea that, yeah, not such a good idea. What is a good idea is to make a plane that's got a fence on and a depth stop on and make them adjustable. And this is something that I'm sure you'll, you'll be familiar with or own. And I can see one behind Jeffrey, so I'm sure he knows what I'm on about. This is your standard moving philister. Um, the fence is set in the base by a couple of screws. You can expose more or less of the blade. The depth stop rises up and down to let you cut further down or less further down. And there's a nicker for when you're working across grain. I bought this as a user tool because I wanted to use it in making furniture. I think I probably paid about 10 quid for it. And unsurprisingly, because it's not a very rare maker after all, just like half of Jim's planes, I catch the light, can't really 
it's a Gabriel, um, one of the most prolific, successful tool making businesses there's been. But that does mean, like the one I started with, it's probably 200 years old. And I do think you, know, you don't actually have to have this many to have some really good value tools that are fascinating as old objects, but still do the job they were made for. And of course, once you get one moving philister, a few more will follow. And this is a lovely one. This was given to me by Ted Cole. I hope he's on. He was going to be, but I can't quite see all the participants at the moment. It's from Heels of Nottingham. It will be somewhere in the first three quarters of the 19th century. Now, with, with tools that um, were popular, that every serious woodworker needed, toolmakers soon grasped the idea that you could sell a basic model for 10 bob, and then you could add on extra features until you'd found the whole depth of your potential customer's pockets. And you could see that this one, rather than having two screws on the bottom, it's got three screws, so that's extra. And rather than having um, a, a depth, uh, depth stop that wobbles about a bit, like that one, it's got a screw on it to hold it tight in position. And then the real show off bit, where the corner is reinforced with boxwood to take the heavy wear where the most of the work is done, if I can get the light right, can you see there's a lovely bit of dovetail boxing where this whole strip is fitted not just with glue, but with tiny long dovetails which go the whole length of the plane. Remember, these are all made by hand. This is done by a plane maker standing at the bench making planes every day. There's a lovely description in a book which I could show you later. It's in Salomon's Dictionary of Woodworking Tools of the process to go through to make the grooves and then the, the portions to fit in the grooves. And naturally, it needs a set of specialist planes. That pattern there probably needs five special planes to make the tiny groove, to make the tiny tongue, to widen them out into an exactly right size dovetail where you're working to a few thou tolerance. It's got to be in just the right position and stay straight all along. And you've got to make it at an economic rate to make a, a tool that the intended user can afford to buy. I mean, these are objects as a tribute to their makers, if nothing else. I could go on about moving philisters a bit longer, but I shan't. Um, I'll just show one more, which again, I'd, I'd bought as a user. It's got three screws, big deal. It's also got the blade skewed the opposite way. Almost all skew philisters, uh, moving philisters are like this one. The leading edge of the skew blade is in the front. It pulls the blade into the cut keeps you up against the, the stops. That one, opposite way round. Is it just the Scots being different? Is it a mistake? No, apparently not. Again, it's optimized for the task. If you're making a raised panel and you're leaving a field in the middle and a, making a, a low margin around the edge to go in a groove, you'll work your way around clockwise planing down. As the, the blade leaves the, the wood of planing, especially when you're going cross grain, you're less likely to splinter it out if the corner of the blade is following on. Think of it like a skew chisel on a lathe and not catching the corner in. So for that sort of purpose, it's probably a little bit better. Um, 
we could divert onto panel raising planes, but um, I'm looking at the clock and gosh, it's nine o'clock already. And um, I'll cover just three or four more, if that's okay. Uh, give us a nod or shake your head, Jeff. Because, yeah, all right, fine. Um, I mentioned about uh, cutting blazing bars and so on. Um, I know a little bit about it. Most of what I know I've learned from Richard Arnold. I hope he's on. Um, and clearly, the tool that developed and won is this. You look on eBay, you'll see this described as a plough plane. It's not, of course, it's a sash philister. Um, it's got a fence like a plough plane, but it's designed to cut a rebate, not on the wood, a piece of wood, not on the wood next to you, like this wood. That would just cut on the edge that you can see. This cuts on the far side. And that matters for a couple of reasons. One is that it can be more accurate if you're sizing everything off the same reference face. That's always a good principle. Um, uh, but also because when you're making um, sash window components, you'll be looking at the way the grain runs and you'll be choosing stock where the grain runs downhill because you'll be you'll be putting a molding on the other edge with a a plane like this to make the the shape of the sash that needs nice mild stock you've got it arranged that way around with the sash philister there's no need to turn the wood end to end you can work down the grain the same way it's a bit of a funny lump though isn't it how do you actually hold a sash philister well old tools often provide an answer and this is why i disagree with too much cleaning on old tools if you look at this one you can see the body is blackened by tallow over the years and dirt but there are these beautiful clear spots so you can see your hand goes here, finger there, thumb there, rest of the hand on that clean bit there. Left hand goes here onto that pale bit and that pale bit. And that's the position for holding it. The, the answer is there staring you in the face as long as you don't sand it back. To nothing. Bit of a complication though, isn't it? Having one sort of rebate plane to plane a near side and the other sort to plane a far side. What you could do is combine them into one plane. And this is the rarest one I'm going to show you tonight. This is a combined moving and sash philister. So there's a depth stop on this side, there's a depth stop on this side, there's a nicker on this side, and on here. The fence will slide, sorry about the view, slide all the way across underneath. You can register onto the far side or onto the near side. This is a very odd plane. Again, I must say, this was a very generous present from Ted Cole. I do hope he's there, I do hope he's listening. Um, and it was a right puzzle. I didn't really notice who'd made it when I first saw it. There's a faint name on one end that says, Reed. Hmm. Who's Reed? Couldn't find Reed in the plane maker's book. I looked again and it also says Utica. Sorry if I've mispronounced that. I'm sure somebody will correct me, like Chester, you'll know. Um, it's in New York State. 
John Reed came from Wales, moved to America, carried on his plane making trade. Um, the company uh, was there at the end of the 19th century. I've lost me a bit of paper that I've written the dates on. Here we are. Um, it would have been made no later than 1898, I think it was, when the, when the company closed. Um, how did it come to be in England? You won't be able to see this, but it's also got a name on the back of a tool dealer, which says, uh, Milburn, 389 Hornsey Road. But it didn't take long to find that Hornsey Road is in London. There was a tool dealer called Milburn there um, between about 1918 and, uh, hang on, lost my place in my notes, sorry, a bit later. And, yeah. Yeah, from 1916 to 1919 or 20 thereabouts. So somehow this tool dealer who wasn't there earlier has bought this plane that was made in America 20 years previously. You know, the latest date for the plane with that name on is uh, 1894. Earliest date for it to be sold in London, uh, 1916. Somehow, you know, is it laying on somebody's unsold, difficult to shift pile for 20 years? We'll never know. But I said it's also been altered. And if I get the light right, you can see there's a bit of boxwood reinforcement down to the corners there. But the whole plane has been wrapped up in extra bits of rosewood. Rosewood down the side, across the sole, down the other side. It's then had an extra wide iron welded up as a modern iron and put in there. And there's another name on the end, Kingshot. And that would be a familiar name to some of you. This modified plane was modified by Jim Kingshot, who wrote the book on making and modifying woodworking tools. His work comes full circle. He's taken a very unusual, rare combination plane that hardly anybody made, an even rarer variant that's got screw arms rather than wedge arms, and he's made it into a beautiful one-off and it survived. And now I own it and I'm really happy. And that's a bit of the pleasure of, you know, owning woodworking tools and planes in particular. You'll recognize the design of this a bit. It sort of comes through into that sort of ugly utilitarian um, rebate plane where you can put the fence on the other side. I don't suppose anyone ever does, but that's about the one design out of all these that survives. You can go into screw fix and buy one of those. They'll charge you 90 quid for it. It's only got one star reviews that say it's awful, but it's there as an option. I would rather have and use all of these other lovely things because there's the history, there's the ingenuity, there's the variety, and there's still practical tools that do the job they were made for and help me make furniture. Seems all right to me. Is it time to stop? Uh, Andy, that, that, that was absolutely brilliant. Fascinating. And the way that you've just been able to talk fluidly about all the different types and variants and, and your, your history, you know, you're able to go back and research where the people came from. I mean, that's just, it's got me thinking now. And I've, I've, I've been looking at the planes behind me. I'm looking at the names thinking, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll Google some of the makers and, and the ages and things. Mm. I mean, absolutely. It's the fun. Yeah. Gosh. Wow. 
Um, um, and I've left, I've left a lot out. I mean, if you want more rebate planes, there's a few more behind me that I've not, not covered at all. Wow, wow. Well, a whole other subcategories, but I thought I'd better stop. Well, maybe, maybe we can come back in a, in a, in a few weeks' time and, and go on to round <laughs> two of the, of the plane collection. I think it's really good and, and really interesting to hear how, how you, know, you can talk through it. So, so let, let's go to a few questions um, and let, let's kick off with some of those to start with. Um, so I'm allowing people to unmute themselves. And uh, Matthias, Matthias is up first. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Andy. That was, uh, as usual on this channel, a uh, most interesting talk. Uh, two questions I'd like to ask you. Uh, the first one is, is similar to one I asked uh, on a previous bench talk, namely, what is the sort of ratio of frogs to princes when you are buying these tools uh, without being able to inspect them in person. Mm. Uh, and the second is, so some of these are quite old and obviously quite a few of them have already been modified in one way or another by previous owners and users. And from the way you talked about them, it, you made it very much sound as if you do buy them to use them, not to collect them. So uh, how, how happy or how, how uh, inclined are you to carry on the tradition of uh, modification and tweaking and doing stuff to them to make them do your uh, job yep. for you? Um, I think the easiest way to answer that is to think, what have I actually done? Mm. And I haven't modified any of these. Um, mm. I might, if I needed to, clamp a fence on, but I'd actually, if I needed a fence, I'd choose one that had got an adjustable fence built into it and use that. Yeah. And I, I haven't uh, turned any of them into anything else, and I don't like doing that, really. Um, I'd sooner buy another tool that was already right than, yes. than mess one up. And I'm aware, too, that there are tools there like that very first one that I had no idea it was 200 years old and I ought to you know, give it a bit more respect mm -hmm. but I do I can use that because it's in good using condition and um, and I'm not going to wear it out the amount of woodwork I do and the amount it's shared out amongst you know, a selection of tools yes. um yeah I'm not going to wear anything out it'll be fine um as to frogs and princes um there is a lot of rubbish on eBay. Mm -hmm. um, I've been lucky to be able to get quite a few of these and see them in person. Um, quite a few will have come from previous sales at Richards or at David Stanley auctions. Yeah. Um, top tip if you're buying things on eBay that are local to you and collection is offered, go along in person. Yeah. Several times I've gone for one thing and come back with another box full that the the seller was you know, wondering what to do with or thinking of listing. Um, some of them have come from Bristol Design, which is a, a great shop in Bristol, which has been there for over 30 years and I've been a customer all the time. It's been there, I think. Um, it's a rare survivor of a, a real in-person old tool shop. Yeah. And long may it thrive. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. I mean, I, 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 there are more questions popping up in my head, sure, already, no, but, no. but uh, I can see in the chat that there are people in the queue, so I'll, I'll shut up for now. And if there's room at the end, okay. I'll come back. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. Um, Jim, Jim Hendricks, up next. Hi, Andy. Fantastic, as usual. I mean, we got COVID this year, and normally you and I have seen each other, what, twice now? And we both missed that opportunity. So it's, it's wonderful to play catch up and see some of the tools that you've got in your, I mean, the benefit is we see your workshop and your, and your fantastic tool collection. I just want to augment. Do you have any uh, planes? I've got a, I've got a couple here. <laughs> see, I just, I just want to, you talked about um, the, they go from, um, Pretty, pretty simple. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a simple but rare one, which is, which is that one, which is from the uh, seat and chest comment that you made, um, oh, Gabriel. Yeah. Obviously, yep. I, um, have, I, I left out dado planes. So I thought you know, that would just take yeah, yeah. another it's, half it's hour. It's actually, it's actually a. 
um, the stepped uh, fence on it. That's the, um, whatever you said it was earlier. But the one I wanted to show you, because we go from simple to sophisticated, and this one is, I don't know how clear it is, mm. but it's stunningly beautiful. We talk about the boxing at the end, mm. and this one has boxing in boxwood, but it also has ebony on the very corner. Oh, yeah. And it is by a lady, uh, a moon and moon in uh, down in St. Martin's Lane in London. And it uh, is a stunningly beautiful thing. It is. It's it's a pity you can't actually feel, but it is beautifully so we'll made. Post it off to me and I'll, I'll let you know. I'll post it off to you. I'll send it to you next week. OK, <laughs> you can you can rip it from my dying hands if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but but the one I wanted to show is actually nice. to show to show Richard. Do you recall we sat uh, talked about um, repairing planes, repairing wooden planes back in the day? I think it was at David Stanley, but Richard will probably correct me if I'm wrong. But the, the, the cunning Watsits gave me. He said, "You collect Gabriels." Do you remember they gave me a moving oh, philister, yes. which had no no front to it. Mm. Okay, the mm. whole front as we're seeing so i thought i'd just show yeah. um to see whether you can tell which part's original and which part because none of this or the depth stop or the base was there it was just this part and that part so you know it and it it was so important because it is a gabriel yeah um so all of this boxing here is new so it was, just, it was just a comment for the for bench oh. talks just to show basically um how you know when something is that valuable which it clearly is it's very it's it's i find this is where i i, I love doing is getting something that's that much of a basket case mm. and it, oh, link, yeah. it links in yeah. with what matthias says about basket cases or princes and and uh paupers if you like um this was very much a hobo I think that's for the Americans, by the way, a tramp. Mm. Um, and as you can see, it's very much usable now. Um, yeah. And authentic to the day. So there you go. That's my show and tell bit. Just to I, augment your beautiful I, collection. I do hope you hide your initials on the new bit somewhere. I haven't. I'm not <laughs> that I'm not that. Um, uh, immodest but uh, no but it's just a joy to bring yeah. something back I mean it was very very much um, I think it was Richard playing let's challenge Jimmy time so anyway well let me very before, much. before we go to the next question then let me just give you a line the notice in the um, Salomon dictionary of woodworking tools sorry I'm holding up the wrong camera there uh, in this book yeah um, yep. where it's got the description of how to do the boxing uh, with all the different special planes. It does say about the, the sloping boxing like you've just shown us, the tools and methods for working the sloping grooves for these boxings are not known. So perhaps yeah. you've rediscovered it or worked it out from first principles. Well, I'm not sure if I can, I mean, this one's much clearer. Um, you know, you can see with, um, I mean, when it was Anne Moon, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. actually yeah. Anne Moon's uh, took over from her husband who died prematurely and ran the company. I, I'd like to think that she was one of the first female woodworkers, but um, I, I'm pretty sure she ran the business and ran it beautifully yeah. because it know. was virtually bankruptcy. But you can see how it's cut in. I think it's mm. basically a, a rebate on a slant and then a bit chopped off. That's what yeah. I would do. Cut, yeah. cut the rebate, cut the rebate like that, a very thin rebate. And they're just off and fix yeah. it on. But it's I, beautifully. I imagine, you'd, I imagine you'd make some sort of jig that would hold the plane at the angle, so you could. Cut yeah. It yeah, you just have the have it like that, mm. and just plane down into it. It's. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, it's it's like you say, it it probably was. I I haven't seen this com in combination with ebony on the bottom oh, that's, that's... on any other plane and it is very very posh and i think it, it i think to a, in a way it does it does almost represent a lady's touch i'd like to think 
It was around the corner from where I used to work in London, uh, near Lincoln's Inn Field. And um, it, it's kind of beautiful in its, it's a piece of art. Mm. And, and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's another difference between that and, and the, and the rebate, metal rebate that you showed from Skewfix, um, yeah. Screwfix. It's, it's, these things are pieces of art, in my opinion. Anyway, I won't take up too much more time, but thank you very much. It was, it was fun. Well, it was wonderful. Lovely, lovely. Chester, over to you, over to the Americans well, now. I was sure that there were other people ahead of me. Um, let me just say, Andy, to begin with, um, I really don't have any specific questions um, as much as to say that um, I, I think that you wax poetic and have a nice um, balance between admiration for these pieces as works of art, as Jim said, and, and the technology involved in creating them, as well as an appreci appreciation for, for the technology that they expose as, uh, uh, as uh, you know, incrementally to the time period that they were used. And, and the purposes. I, I find fascinating some of the coach makers ones that you have, particularly with the curved bases, which mm. act as fences to allow you to cut a, a rebate along a, a, a peripheral uh, exterior arc. Yeah. I think those yeah. are fascinating. And I really, really appreciate your appreciation for them. <laughs> and the fact that you're, you were talked about not cleaning all the tallow off because yeah. there are hints and information on all of these pieces as historical markers that I think are is just as important as having an impeccable tool. And, and that said, mm. it, this is one of my problems with a great deal of collectors who their first question to me is, how do I restore this plane? Yeah. And it, just to keep it. Yeah, dust just it. keep keep it dusted, examine yeah. it. If you can't use it, find one or buy one that you can use. Yeah. But um, at any rate, I I, I I think it's fascinating, and I, I think that you have a, a wealth of uh, of things to share there with us. And thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, it all gets more interesting once you actually use the tools. I'm I'm never going to start collecting I don't know Thatcher's tools because I wouldn't have a spare cottage that needed a new thatch roof. Now, I wouldn't be able to put them to use and see why they were the way they are. And I think that's why I like woodworking tools because everyone needs to do some woodwork occasionally. And so you can actually discover that, you know, of course that skewed blade makes it easier to hold it into the, where the cut goes. Now, as much as you said that um, you would not modify a plane, um, I guess, mostly because uh, you, you feel like you'd be infringing on another person's history. I think that we have to acknowledge that your time owning these planes is as much a part of the history as the past. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of woodworkers um, not only just modified them to suit a purpose, but I don't know if you can see this one. And I think I showed it once. Oh, oh. Um, uh, I guess that's, yeah. Uh, okay. So you see that curve, and then I'll show the front of it. Yeah. And this I, I found in uh, in Florence, and and it was a little woodworking shop down an alley, and this eighty five to ninety year old gentleman had made this plane to serve a specific purpose. Yeah. And it yeah. had no iron, and it was sitting on the on the floor in the rubbish <laughs> pile no. because he'd already used it, and he had no need for it after that. He right, stole yeah. the iron from it to use it somewhere else, and he gave it to me as a gift. And I, I think it's a phenomenal plane. Mm. Um, you know. Anyway, that's I thought I'd share that. Well, that shows the approach to the task, doesn't it? That it's part of doing the job is to prepare a tool for the job. Um, you know, just as a, I don't know, a modern woodworker might need to write some G code to control a CNC mill or something. You know? Exactly. You've got to get yourself in a position for the wood to get cut. But lovely example. Yeah. Thank you for a great presentation. It could go on. <laughs> it will. <laughs> wow. Brilliant. Brilliant. And that's a lovely, uh, lovely example there, Chester. Um, Mikkel, up next. Can you unmute? Okay. So 
I, I unfortunately I cannot show something that nice as you have, but maybe it, it's also a nice variation on planes to this evening. So I have a pair of planes actually, which are relatively new. It's it's no old plane. It, it's uh, machine made, I guess. It also has on the fence. Um, it's not uh, a dovetail, but it's some so sort of finger joint, I guess. All oh, right, yeah. Uh, but it's still nice because it's a pair of planes, which makes a tongue and groove. Yes, yes. they have the proper uh, yeah proper setup to create a tongue and groove. And what is nice about the plane is actually that the escapement is at the top, mm. and the fence sort of works like this. You have the two screws for the for the distance and one basically to, to lock the, the fence in place. And what is nice, you can just turn it around. You can unscrew the whole thing and put the, mm. the fence on the other side. If you want to go against the grain, you can just reverse the fence and go the other way. And so you can al also always plane downhill. So although it's not so nice and old, it's still a very interesting set of planes. Yeah. And um, yeah, to make tongue and grooves. Who's that? I got it very cheap on eBay, but I um, haven't made it work yet because it doesn't hold the, the irons well, so it, it unsets itself, so I have to tune it to make it actually work. But it's a nice thing, so I thought I, I show it a little bit around. Do you know who it's made by? No, there is no marker sign on it. It's completely untouched in terms of, of any name or whatever. The only thing which is on the, on the plates um, I have some sort of, let's see how we can make this work. It's some sort of flower or, or oh, yeah. flowery sign or sort. Yeah. And then this one, it's uh, also some kind of flowery thing. I don't know, but I, I think the um, the irons don't belong to the blade, uh, to, to the plane. Right. It, I guess it's some sort of homemade thing. I don't know. Because also when you have a look at the, the body, um, it seems that the um, the fence was cut from from one piece, so yeah. the, the yeah. marking goes all around, and then they just cut the fence and put some part on, on at the bottom, I guess. So I don't know whether it's really some um, it, it might thing or whether it's some homemade thing or something. I don't know. It might be that there's a a company in the Czech Republic. <clears throat> I'm not sure how you pronounce it. it Spelled P I N I E, Pinie, Pinie, um, who still make quite a wide range of wooden woodworking planes. Um, and there's a video, <coughs> a very old video on YouTube showing them using <coughs> uh, machinery to cut the, the shapes and to route out the mouth. Um, and if you look at, I think, pinie.cz.com, possibly. Um, you might find that style on their on their website in their range, and they are around. eBay's sort of place they'd show up. Good to see that the wooden planes live on. <coughs> Thanks. Lo lovely. Um, right. So ne next is uh, all the way over to Brazil. Um, Thiago. Hi everyone. Nice to be back. <laughs> Uh, well, it's it's, it's uh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to to join everyone in thanking uh, Dave for the lovely presentation, and um, yeah. So it it, it it was really nice to see your uh, sense of care and and love for those planes. And uh, just uh, you 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 were talking, and I was uh, I just remember the, the there's a word in Russian for. The, the Russian word for, for thing, I believe, is it, it's uh, a vesh, which is the same word for passage. So there's this notion, and it's present uh, in language, that uh, things are messengers, and they mm. do carry history and memory and uh, and ways of working and, and, and really seeing a way to, to see the world. So it, it was lovely to see that. And uh, I came to woodworking. Uh, working uh, with musical instruments and historical musical musical instruments and and you see that if, if you just oh, want right. to change something or or uh, uh, or if you, if you do believe in progress and you think that things mm. you know should be uh, 
better and, and, and then you, you just you, you can uh, uh, really do uh, great damage to, mm. to things if mm. you do if you're not that respectful when using and caring and even restoring a tool so just just a big thank you and uh, I was yeah. really touched by your uh, your talk thank you <laughs> I, musical instruments what a lovely way into the whole world of it where you know, there is, I presume, yeah, yeah. a lot of respect for the past and for hand methods, as well as yeah. What we do now, we we, we had robots. we had a yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna butt in here a bit, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna do my bullying part actually because um, uh, you know, we we hear a lot from the Americans, we hear a lot from the Brits, but we don't hear much from from Brazil. So Thiago, do you want to talk to us about? Brazil and about woodwork in Brazil, maybe next week. Oh, I I'd be delighted. Yeah, if I can find something interesting, <laughs> and uh, if I can keep uh, if I can keep myself from talking about politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm sure that uh, you, you'll be able to find something. There's lots of things. I mean, you know, you, you've got a great channel that you put out there, and you, you've had loads of different speakers as well. So, I, 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 it would be just great to hear it from from a Brazilian. Um, uh, point of view so you know we look forward to to next week if, if that's all right with you nice yeah looks looks uh, awesome thanks brilliant right. thank you Thiago okay ne next question up is um Eric hi there uh, so that, thanks and that was a fascinating talk I think it's really interesting to see how you were able to work out uh, how, the, how the tools were actually used uh so I've, I've got a plane here which i can't quite work out what it was, what it was for. Right, it's, uh, right. it, was, it was full of it was full of wood, woodwork, uh, full of wood, woodwork, full of woodworm. Sorry, on it. Uh, the blade is a sort of strange looking. But where's the camera? Uh, there, it's good. It's sharp. You know, it's, it's not, I've never cleaned it up, but it looks as though it's been sharpened on the on the long edge, uh, and it's just rusty on the other side. So it doesn't look as though it's ever been sharpened. So when you put it in the in the, the plane, which has got a sort of strange strange shape, like that. So when you put it in, uh, it comes out, and the cutting edge is on the on the flat side here. So the only thing I can think of is it was for doing sort of the shoulders of a, a, a narrow and deep wedge, but I can't quite think why, you know, what, what, what purpose you would use that for. So I don't know if you've got any insights into that. There doesn't seem to be much of a name on it. The, there's a, something that looks like a Hather Fritch, H-A-T-H-E or F-R-S-I-C-H on it, but it's, it's a, a sort of, proper looking uh, mark on it, but it's, it's kind of slightly squint. So it's maybe not been a, a maker's mark, but it's uh, the, the, just an owner's mark. So I don't, I don't know. So I don't know if there's anything that you could uh, enlighten me about this. I've yeah. never caused to sharpen it up or use it yet. It was one I got uh, along with a, another plane and, and a, a bit of eBay. So this, this one was like a, a sort of, and here's another one, you know, a freebie almost. Cool. That's the perfect lead-in, Eric, to another subcategory I didn't have time to cover. Ah. These are the same as yours. These, that's a pair. Oh, great. Yes. Left and right, they're side rebate planes. Right. And if you've got a tongue and groove joint and your groove is a little bit too narrow, uh -huh. this will fit down into the narrow groove, that's why it's so thin, and mm. cut along the side of it right. make the groove uh, wider it won't cut going down because you don't no, want the groove to get deeper uh, and the, the iron should actually be um, blunt on the tip yes it is yes uh, cut along the side but because getting a good cut in that position is really affected by the way the grain runs you do need the left and right pair Mm -hmm. um, and oh, right, right. So I've only got the one. Uh, so. <laughs> You've only got one. Mm -hmm. There's various later metal versions of it 
that combine the two blades into one body. Yes, I've seen, I've seen them, yes. Um, that's, that's the record one from a, from a Preston design. Yes, yeah, so I've, I've seen that. Uh, the, the little blade on one edge and on the other that will again uh, sit down uh, in the groove uh -huh. and widen it. Um, and I've got... Excuse me, give you a long answer to this, but it's a lovely question. Um, another yeah. example of woodworkers' economy. Here's a side rebate, mm -hmm. and some people will have by now recognised origins with that distinctive floral pattern in the casting. But you can see the the iron um, slips down here and just pokes through. Mm. And you just push that along the side. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a Stanley 45 mm. that's been broken and a bit's been salvaged, a slot's been cut, clamp's been fabricated, and a, an economically minded woodworker has converted a sad broken tool mm. into a useful one. All right. Oh, fascinating. Gosh, yeah. Long may that tradition continue. Indeed, yes. Uh, I must, I've given the benefit of the doubt that they didn't deliberately uh, trash the plane to do it. Uh, <laughs> that would be wrong. Well, 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 side well, rebates. Thanks very much. That, that's useful. I'll maybe sharpen it up, see if I find a need for it. <laughs> when I was refurbishing our sash windows, the only replacement staff bead I could get, uh, parting bead, was just a little bit too wide for the grooves. So I was actually using the wooden side rebates to widen the groove a bit. And being wood and bigger and easy to get hold of, mm. it was a much nicer tool to use, stretching up to a six foot sure, yeah, and so true, yeah. little metal thing. Oh, well, great. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andy. Thanks, cheers. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, next up is uh, Stephen. Okay. I really, really enjoyed the, the coach right planes that you showed. Uh, for the first 30 years of my volunteer work at Sutter's Fort, I portrayed James Wilson Marshall, who most people attribute to finding gold at a mill that he was building. But in reality, he was a master coach right. And so I started amassing a coach right tool chest. And uh, the three, three basic tools other than your standard saws and, and uh, drills, but you have the different, different lengths because you're dealing with, as you said, um, tight shapes because in a coach, there's no such thing as a 90 degree angle. Mm. Mm. Everything is on the curve, compound curves. Your doors yeah. not only had an arc to them, but sometimes may have a bulge. So they're doing a lot of steam work and, and or using green wood that they could press into forms that was wow. thin in veneers and layering on. Um, the uh, Marshall's family ran a coach works in Lambertville, New Jersey. Uh, which is, well, I won't go into that history, but the, the, the three types of tools that Coach Wright would use would be your planes that you have. I have a number of them, a lot of um, compass and com, uh, concave. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I, but you also had draw knives. I have draw knives that the blade is only a quarter of an inch wide. Oh. And you have... Um, uh, spoke shades that had right and left beading. Um, ah. There's just there's yeah. just a tremendous amount of different types of tools, and they're all specialized. And I think that the plane that had the the side radius on it mm. was for doing wheel wells. The radius of ah. where the fenders would go into the body of the coach, or 
that arcing area that had to stay clear of of uh, the wheels, even though the wheels were set outside the yeah. body. Mm. And coach right and, and or coach and carriage right were all they did was make the bodies. They they would take it down to a point where the body would attach to the um, suspension system, whether it be just leather, reinforced leather, or modern day the leaf springs that started to show up in the mid 1800s. Mm. And um, from the leaf springs to the wheels, that's all a wheelwright. And so they have a, def a, a, a different set of tools. And Marshall was a master coach, right? Which meant he could teach it. And he was also a journeyman wheelwright. So that meant he could, he was trained because there were, he came from five generations of master coach rights in um, central New Jersey along the Delaware River. For anyone who's in America, probably knows where it is, but it's north of Philadelphia, south of Trenton. And um, they, it's, it's I, I've given that up yet. I still have all the tools, but I, I don't demonstrate that anymore. We've gone away from portraying 1840s caricatures and using the tools that were of that period to uh, modern day compare and contrast. But just to, that I'm pretty sure that the, the side compassed um, rabbit plane that you showed uh, mm -hmm. was for doing the wheel, the, the arc in fore and aft of the body of the carriage and coach. Wagons, they're very angular, 90 degrees, simple to put together, but coach work was probably the pinnacle of woodwork mm -hmm. skills and arts in the 17, 18, all the way, well, 1600s, let's see, the, my, I've got books going back to 15, 14, 1500s, coach and carriage and uh, works. And so anyway, Thank you. That was, uh, I, I'm glad to see that one because I haven't been able to find one to add to my collection. Oh, <laughs> well, it's good I'll to know one. that the knowledge is safe but that it continues to be understood. And I'm, I'm really admiring of the, the sort of work that um, the living history places like, like yours and Colonial Williamsburg and so on do to, to deepen the understanding. Because you know, like we said earlier, you can only really understand why at all is the way it is when it's in somebody's hands being used and the, the reason then makes sense. And unfortunately with Colonial Williamsburg, there's they're such nitpickers <laughs> in the technology is they need to document, historically document from raw material to finish good and every stage in between. And in some cases they're able to go into trash pits, uh, wells that no longer gave water, they would throw their waste in there. And those mm. become uh, anthropo uh, archaeological, anthropological um, gold mines of information. So yeah. while they demonstrate wheel building, wheel writing, they do not demonstrate coach building because mm. they don't have the A through Z uh, approach right. to yeah. raw material to finish good. Yet they are building coaches and carriages in the tradition. It's just they don't have out on um, yeah. on display because they are they do not want to give wrong information to the public. Right. So if they they figured out maybe between C and L. The, the, <laughs> they guess it and so mm. they can't show the whole process and that's why it's 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 great that we have these types of tools out there and people collect them and i, and I think i think on that note um you know this is uh something for the future as well because um 
you know, if we think about all the knowledge and the skills that are being shared here on the bench talk, um, and, and literally every week we're recording them and we're putting up on YouTube, you know, you don't have to go digging through an old well, you can you can go digging online and, and find out about all the talk. So on that note, Andy, thank you ever so much for, for doing your talk. And it was really, really interesting. So I'd like everybody to to raise their bench beverages. And to to Andy and the bench, thank you very much. Thank you. I could go on and on. And I think we should we have a part two or something, didn't we? It's a high tech conversation and a low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101.